The Britannia class were designed in a period when the French Navy looked up at their surroundings and realised the Navy actually had some serious problems. Before the Dreadnought Revolution, every other nation had seen sense in designing a single battleship and then building a whole class to the same design. By contrast, partially due to some strange ideas about design, and partially due to a somewhat corrupt system that meant every company in an industry had to get some part of the contract, the French had built what was called the Fleet of Experiments, a series of effectively handcrafted artisan battleships where none were alike. Even an attempt at building a single class had left them with three unique ships that were never fully quite compatible. Whilst they eventually mostly fixed this, it meant that by 1910 France had precisely zero dreadnoughts in service or under construction. By contrast, the British had 10 plus 5 battlecruisers, Germany had 8 and 1, and the United States 6 and 1. They finally got around to building their first dreadnoughts, the Corbet class, but desperately needed more ships. Unfortunately, the Corbets were about as big a ship as you could build in 1910-era France, and so the new design would have to be based on them. There was a desire to arm the ships with 13.4-inch guns, but with the same turret layout as Corbet, the weight was too much. Luckily, someone realised that wing turrets were a silly idea, and by putting a single centerline turret in, you could still have a 10-gun broadside without the need for six turrets. Therefore, the ships had 10 13.4-inch guns in five twin turrets, a pair super-firing forward, a pair super-firing at the rear, and one right in the middle. 22 secondary guns of 5.5-inch calibre were joined by four 47mm guns and four torpedo tubes to complete the armament. With a speed of 20 knots, they were somewhat slow, despite their rather thin 11-inch belt armour, although the French were not quite able to resist the urge to tinker, so each ship had a different number of boilers, each from a different manufacturer. Four ships were laid down, the Britannia, the Lorraine, the Provence, and the Vasilisevs Konstantinos. Uh, that last one doesn't sound French. That's because it isn't. The Greek Navy desperately wanted battleships and had come up with a cunning plan. They knew France and Germany hated each other, so they reasoned if they ordered a battleship from each side, then at least one of them would deliver. However, events turned against them, as it so often does with the Greek Navy, because France and Germany promptly went to war with each other and abandoned both ships on the slipways. They should have gone to the British, really. They might have taken the ships away to fight Germany, but at least they would have gotten them back afterwards. Anyway, what about that other Greek ship, the Salamis? Well, that's a story for another time. Anyway, back to the French. All three ships entered service in 1916 and became the leading ships of the French fleet. Mostly, they spent their time deterring the Austro-Hungarian fleet from coming out of harbour, although in a bout of painful irony, the Provence was frequently used to intimidate the Greek government away from supporting Germany. After the First World War, the French had to cut their naval budget, and only Britannia remained in active service the whole time. But as finances improved, all three came back into service, and the French desire to tinker and customise re-emerged. Each ship would therefore receive different numbers of oil-fired boilers to improve their performance, as well as slightly different changes to their turbines. All of them got tripod masts, although, again, always to slightly different layouts. Lorraine had her centre turret taken out in 1935 and replaced with an aircraft catapult and hangar. By the outbreak of the Second World War, they were, inevitably, each almost custom-made battleships. I guess some old habits really just stick. Just for good measure, they would also receive different anti-aircraft fits in stages throughout this period, with a variety of 8mm machine guns, 13.2mm heavy machine guns, 20, 40 and 75mm cannon, and 3.9-inch anti-aircraft guns, in exchange for varying numbers of 5.5-inch secondary guns being removed. Once in the war, the Provence spent time hunting for raiders, Britannia had fun escorting convoys, and Lorraine joined Force X, ready for heavy combat. In 1940, the Britannia was sent to join Provence. It would be a somewhat fateful decision. By June 1940, France was on the verge of falling to the Nazi invasion, and there was serious concern in the UK that the Germans might seize the French fleet. By July, a British force had arrived at the French port of Meurs el Kabir with an ultimatum. This was quite detailed and had many options to it, but thanks to some truly stupendous idiocy by the French admiral in charge, it was transmitted to the French government as simply, join us or scuttle yourselves. 
which quite understandably uh, the, was rejected. Not quite realising this, however, the British took the French refusal to mean they weren't interested in any of the neutral options either, and felt they had to open fire. The thin armour of the French Britannia class came back to haunt them, as Britannia was hit by four 15-inch shells and exploded. Provence was set on fire and sank to the bottom of the harbour, although she would later be salvaged. As it turned out, when the Germans did try to seize the French fleet some time later, the French navy honoured its commitment to not help them and scuttled themselves. As a result, the attack on the French fleet by the British is still a controversial subject to this day. The Lorraine, meanwhile, had a happier fate, initially being disarmed in Alexandria, but in late 1942 she joined the Free French Forces and spent most of 1943 training and refitting before helping in the invasion of southern France, supporting the landings with her main battery gunfire before heading to Britain, where she spent the last months of the war shooting up German-occupied fortresses in northern France. After the war, she served as a training and accommodation ship until 1953, when she was sold for scrapping. And as regards the detail of the attack on Mers el Kabir, that will be a subject for another video in the future, hopefully not the too distant future. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.